All right, so uh, this one was pretty inevitable, I assume. Because I typically try to avoid doing movies that I just talked about if they just came out. And I've been doing this long enough that two years ago is we just talked about that. But especially since it came up at, throughout the award season also. Um, but we, we knew we had to do Clue at some point. And there was the whole idea of Knives Out kind of restarted this whole thing of people being obsessed with uh, like murder mysteries. And the one that always came up first, <laughs> despite, despite all the Agatha Christie adaptations and all that other stuff, um, the one that always came up was Clue. So <laughs> it still holds true. There's um, on Big Brother, one of the contestants on there said that her favorite movie was Clue. <laughs> And I love, and I love how widespread it is. When I got my copy of it, I got this at a Goodwill, like a couple of hours out of town. Mm -hmm. And when I got it, the very unassuming lady behind the counter who was ringing it up said, "Oh, Clue! I love Tim Curry." Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I love this. It's just like the love for it is just everywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. So and it's got um, a great cast too. You've got Christopher Lloyd, Martin Mull, Michael McKean, um, Madeline Collin, Eileen Brennan, Leslie, Leslie Ann Warren. Mm -hmm. um, and and you can say the same thing about Knives Out. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm Dude, guessing... Knives Out 2's cast is almost like end game levels at this point. I love that people found out Ethan Hawke was in Knives Out 2 by accident. Mm. Was, he was nowhere to be found on the cast list and then there were like pictures of the set came out and he was just there and people were like oh Ethan Hawke's in this mm -hmm. so um I there just, for a while it was like every day that you got online someone else knew was confirmed for Knives Out too. yeah and it, can, it makes you wonder like how long this is going to go because um two and three are already green obviously two is already my, two might have just finished shooting or is about to finish shooting and mm -hmm. they were greenlit together mm -hmm. which means daniel craig is fucking rich mm -hmm. like, appar apparently his knives out two and three contract is bigger than his bond one daniel craig could retire tomorrow he's come <laughs> he's come such a long way from a kid in king arthur's court <laughs> And of, and of course, it makes perfect sense because it's like, I've bashed Daniel Craig so many times. Like, I, I think his bond is bland. I think his whole action persona is just so, like, it just does absolutely nothing for me. And then between Knives Out and Logan Lucky, lo and behold, his forte is comedy, <laughs> mm -hmm. as it turns out. <laughs> what do you think of him and the girl with the dragon tattoo? I think, I think he's fine. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's not really much of a demanding role. Obviously, Elizabeth is the the reason for that movie, mm -hmm. for that, those stories. But um, I was going to bring that up also about Craig's forte being comedy by surprise. Mm -hmm. um, is if that's another reason these two are so often paired together compared to other murder mysteries is the like the comedy element that they both have. I think what helps too is. Well, Clue is kind of a Clue has multiple endings, so that's like another story. But <laughs> Knives Out literally keeps you guessing. Like most murder mysteries these days, about halfway through, you know who it is. Yeah, and what's and what's really funny about that is you can pretty much just look at the way the characters behave at the beginning of Knives Out, and pretty much anybody could say it's Chris Evans. <laughs> yeah, but. It's how we get there is so wild. <laughs> there was at least twice that I could count that I thought Chris Evans was going to be a red herring. Yeah. <laughs> and that's and that's the thing is that that was the big drawing factor to Knives Out was it sets itself up as a murder mystery as far as who killed Christopher Plummer. Even though you mm -hmm. got Lakeith Stanfield there the whole time saying he killed himself. Stop investigating. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the thing is, is we 
actually learn what happened to Christopher Plummer like half an hour in. Mm -hmm. Half an hour in, we know what happened. It's the aftermath that's the whole movie. And the movie is so long. There's Mm -hmm. a whole hour and a half after that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And And we go down so many roads. We've got, I guess by this, we're starting with Knives Out. But you go down so many roads. I mean, at one point you've got M. Emmett Walsh like talking about erasing tapes, and and it turns out that Benoit Blanc knew from the very first scene like who was involved. Yeah, <laughs> it's like because they because they have that shot. That's it. By the way, um, I do just want to say um, this is a relief because mm-hmm. the only other time I talked about this in full was the day it came out was when I put my review video up. Mm-hmm. And I didn't go into spoilers. So imagine imagine me having to talk about Knives Out for like 25 minutes without spoiling anything and how fucking hard that is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's like to be able to just go into it now, because, because the internet's a bunch of idiots, I'm going to have to try to remember to have Owen put a spoiler warning on this video since we just right out said it's Chris Evans. <laughs> You just but, came right out and said it. You did the uh, Martin Freeman and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where like the record cuts out. I said these people are idiots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and apparent, like apparently um, there's this, I don't, I don't have a slip cover, but apparently the thing is, is when you get like the Blu-ray or the DVD mm-hmm. the, and you know how the cast is on the cover. Mm-hmm. Apparently, apparently this, these are like certain covers, but the back of the slip cover is all the knives and there's like a circle in the middle of them. Mm-hmm. And I guess when you take the slip cover off and put it the reverse side where it's over the cast, the circle lands on Chris Evans. Oh, that's neat. And all the knives are pointing at him to tell you it's him. <laughs> that's neat. What also <laughs> makes Chris Evans a red herring is, is Michael Shannon's in the cast. Yeah. And he's, and he's got a scene that makes him look so guilty. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's Michael Shannon. He's like, he's, he's so good at playing villains. And you, know and you know what's great is Don Johnson also has slimy down to a T. Mm-hmm. So really the whole fun of it is that they all look pretty guilty because they're all shitty people anyway. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just a matter. It's like the, it's like the fact of, um, you could kind of say the Who Done It style kind of goes into the Hateful Eight. Mm-hmm. It's like they're all pieces of shit. So just <laughs> you can't really judge by how one behaves, mm-hmm. which, which make which means you can get away with having Chris Evans's character be just like that immediately, and you don't feel like you're showing your hand too early. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, and on top of what you were saying, how most people will probably just gravitate towards he's like, if you see somebody that immediately looks guilty, most of your audience will probably just say red herring and move on mm-hmm. if they've seen enough murder mysteries. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, where, well, shit, I lost what I was going to say next. But, <laughs> Did you have any, like, oh, I was talking about um, how it becomes like an entirely different thing, how like it, it has very much the murder mystery feel of the scene where he's interrogating everybody mm-hmm. and we see everybody's different perspective and how we, we even get visuals that are different perspectives, like who's sitting around Plummer when the cake is put in front of him. Mm-hmm. It's like when Jamie Lee Curtis is talking, it's like her and Don Johnson. And when Shannon's talking, it's him and his wife. Mm-hmm. that could have been that could have the interrogation stuff could have been an entire movie mm-hmm. like it very well could, like when it's when it i think once we learn what actually happened and we circle back around to the end of marta's interrogation it's about the 45 minute mark mm-hmm. so you could literally stop that right there like stop it at the end of marta's interrogation that's a masterful short film by itself Hmm. and then we've got a whole new array of shit when the will is read (laughs) Mm -hmm. takes us down all different paths and then because we already know like it's knives out is really known as a murder mystery Mm -hmm. but once we get past the 45 minute mark the entire the rest of the movie is like a blackmail thriller 
of sorts. Mm -hmm. There's not then there's not really a murder mystery element until Fran is killed, and Fran is killed really late in the game. <laughs> yeah, and it's so the just just the structure of it is so you can you, you can see why this movie blew up. This movie made a shitload of money. Mm-hmm. And it, well, that's why it's, that's why I got two sequels greenlit. Yeah, <laughs> and it's. And it helped. It helped a lot. I love the irony that it was released like around Thanksgiving, like the weekend of Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. There is there is an amazing video on YouTube. It's about twenty minutes. It's a, I think it's from Entertainment Weekly, and it's an an like the cast basically interviewing each other. Mm-hmm. And they're at like a Thanksgiving table, hmm. and it's fucking hilarious. Like. Chris Evans and Michael Shannon are like best friends the whole time. <laughs> Michael Shannon's the only one eating the food. <laughs> <laughs> and you can tell how much they get along despite how the whole idea of the movie is how every character hates each other. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, I, lo- I love that. That's like one of my favorite press videos ever. <laughs> the whole the whole family dynamic could be summed up in the scene from Observe and Report where Seth Rogen and Aziz have a fuck you battle. Yeah. <laughs> that's that the, the whole family relationship could be summed up that way man if this if this if this movie was rated r that would have been like half the dialogue mm-hmm. <laughs> that's another thing too like it got a pg-13 rating and stayed interesting like normally when a movie comes down from r to pg-13 it feels like there's a quality dip there I, I think I was reading, it's funny you mentioned that Observer Report thing, because I'm pretty sure I read somewhere that before they went down the PG-13 path, the scene where Ransom says, eat shit, eat shit, eat shit, in the script is fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. Hmm. I'm, I'm pretty sure I read that somewhere. It might be kind of funny, funnier that it's eat shit. <laughs> yeah, because right before that is up your ass. <laughs> I just, I don't know what it is. I don't know if basketball started it or what, but I love the insult of just eat shit. (laughs) Like, I just imagine someone on the other side being like, okay, and then just like taking a fork to cat shit or something. In my, eat shit was birthed into my vernacular after Don't Tell One the Babysitters did. (laughs) Ah, that's a good one too. Because that's, that's, Keith Coogan had the best one ever. Especially since it follows the line, I appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Uh, <laughs> Keith Coogan for Knives Out 3. Let's go. Oh my god, that would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, but it's also kind of funny we're doing this, by the way. Not, not that, you know, they're not already paired together, like, forever by everybody. But um, mm-hmm. when I was rewatching it recently, I forgot about the line where Lakeith Stanfield actually mentions that Christopher Plummer basically lives on a clue board. Because mm-hmm. there's, there's that really great detail where um, he's bas- Plummer's basically had his house built like it's a set in one of his novels. Mm-hmm. Like the secret passages and all the props and all that. Mm-hmm. And it's, and it's, it's, it's interesting how you can have a movie that's just kind of set in a house, but how much production design plays a part so so much did it get nominated for production design uh, i wish it's only uh it's only nomination was original screenplay which was extremely deserved as well <laughs> mm-hmm. um daniel craig and anna de armas got globe nominations which apparently mm-hmm. doesn't matter anymore since the globes might be dead now but <laughs> But um, those are well deserved, also because the perform. We've talked about like the characters in this and all that, um, but all the performances in this really bring it to life in a really big way, also. Mm-hmm. Like, did um, did Ana de Armas especially really impress you in this? Yeah, because I didn't even know who she was before. Yeah, I'd seen her in a couple of things. She was in a shitty horror movie with Keanu Reeves called Knock Knock. That's like really mm-hmm. fucking ridiculous. <laughs> oh my god, I've seen that pop up on Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> what watch it if you dare, I guess. Yeah. Um, and a couple of other things here and there. And she was she was just kind of there, like she didn't really leave any impression. And then and then she would kind of 
hit mainstream attention when she was dating Ben Affleck for a period of time. But this was between that those. And this I thought she really, really stood out in a way that like I was like I was so I was kind of blindsided by how good she was. Mm-hmm. Um, cause she has to really run the gauntlet of things here because there's the whole, cause there's, cause all the tones that are going on in this. Cause I talked about it being so comedy based, mm-hmm. like where, like we were talking about how like Cl- Clue is a flat out comedy. Mm-hmm. Like Cl- Clue has an interesting thing going on where when it starts, it has a cr- kind of a creepy tone mm-hmm. where, where you're not quite sure what you're in for if you don't know. But once it gets going, it's a full-on comedy. Mm-hmm. And I would say, especially because of Blanc's character, Knives Out is also pretty much comedy. But there's... Would you would you watch a movie where, like, Benoit Blanc was transported in to investigate Mr. Body's murder with all of those characters? No. <laughs> Yeah, they, they need to do like a uh, dead men don't wear plaid kind of thing and put Daniel Craig in Clue as like Clue as it is. <laughs> yeah, would you would you be on board for that? I would make that myself. <laughs> <laughs> Ima- imagine if we went full tilt and we replaced Ma- uh, um, is Marta is her name, right? Yeah, we replaced Marta with uh, Wadsworth. <laughs> man well, Walter will have to really pull out his dramatic jobs <laughs> I mean it's Tim Curry it could be done That's it. there is that one scene where he talks about his dead wife mm-hmm. <laughs> but then but then Walter's one of those characters where you never quite know if he's bullshitting or not <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, just I guess just like any character in a murder mystery you never know who's bullshitting and who isn't yeah, and Wadsworth, like by the end, comes across as almost like like a used car salesman. Yeah, especially depending on which ending you go with. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love that Wadsworth is something different at the end of each end. <laughs> yeah. And the funny thing is, is I think, I think you could have done the same thing with Knives Out, and all the endings would have been plausible. Yeah. Yeah, because that's the guess that's the thing about Clue is like, because because the whole thing about Clue and the three endings was when it first came out, different theaters got a different ending, mm-hmm. um, which is really cool. But it's like, did we we probably saw Clue for the first time the same way? When you say I I saw Clue the Comedy first Central. time. Central. Yeah, it played constantly on Comedy Central. Mm-hmm. And so I've only ever known Clue, and I imagine pretty much everybody's this way. If we, if if Knives Out did it in the way Clue did, would the equivalent of Michael McKean going "I'm going home to sleep with my wife" be Chris Evans going "I'm going home to sleep with my wife"? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there's another version of that that would make, <laughs> but I can't. But um, but yeah, I was saying that um, I can't. And I imagine most people feel this way. I can't imagine Clue without all three endings. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like there, there'd just be something unsatisfying about it once you've seen it with all three endings. Would you say that the Clue and its multiple endings would count as, like, one of, like, the iconic, like, film endings? Yeah, you probably could say that. What else would you put in that? Like, what other, like, what other endings stick with you? Like it's kind of like a side conversation, like like a movie that just like when it ends, you're like, man, what a great ending. I think everybody knows what I'm gonna say. <laughs> obviously, obviously, my ending of all endings is uh, I'm trying real hard to be the shepherd. <laughs> mm. <I> mean, that's <laughs> but um, I'm assuming you have one. Yeah, for me, like. Like, I know a lot of people aren't going to agree with it, but my favorite film, den- film ending of all time is Batman 89. Like, starting with right after we cut from where the Joker's dead on the ground, like, you get so much there. You find out Knox is alive, which is earned because he actually tried to help people. I saw a subreddit that said that uh, Alexander Knox saved more people than Batman did that day. 
Um, <laughs> but you find out that he lived. You get the reveal of the bat signal, which, yes, Nolan did it well and begins, but to introduce the bat signal, that's what you do. And then you get like, you're going up the buildings and the music's building and building as it goes up. And then just the end shot is just Batman staring at the uh, bat signal. And it's just like, fuck yeah, that's the guy in charge now. <laughs> like no more bullshit in this town. So like that for me, like that's why I enjoy that ending. Like when I see that ending, it's just like, fuck yeah, that's, that's the superhero that I grew up liking and that's why. Yeah, because I can't, much like Pulp Fiction and Batman, with Clue, I honestly just can't imagine it any other way because on, there's a feature on the DVD where you can either watch it like the, obviously like that or you can have it just land on one of the endings. Mm -hmm. And I've always humored the idea of watching it with just one of the endings and I've never been able to bring myself to do it. I just feel like it would be it wouldn't like almost like it wouldn't be worth the ride somehow, even though I love the movie in total. Mm -hmm. But it's like it would just feel so it'd be like blue balls or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like because I mean the endings do work individually. Mm -hmm. But I know there's just something so satisfying. And you would think it'd be like almost a cop out. Because mm -hmm. a, a murder mystery has to have the ending, the killer, mm -hmm. or killers but, but, if you're going by. Like how crazy season. how crazy is the clue has built all this through comedy but still built built three credible endings that piece together yeah because like, yeah. there's a lot of movies that can't do that with one person yeah because i because their motivation yeah. makes no sense yeah because i feel like when you look at knives out it has so much <laughs> mm -hmm. that leads to what our ending is and re really it is kind of almost almost feels like multiple endings in one because it's like because there's so many different threads because it's a whole twist in itself the idea of ransom going in and switching the bottles mm -hmm. and that's a big reveal it's a big emotional reveal when we realize plumber would have been would have lived mm-hmm because of the ac the accident that would have made it right what ransom tried to do mm -hmm. and that's a big reveal in itself and when that whole thing ends and lakeith stanfield just kind of reacts he's like good god or whatever um that feels mm -hmm. like an ending and then you can forget about the fran thing until blanc says oh but we've still got more to unravel and it's like oh shit yeah there's more <laughs> there's more ending <laughs> mm -hmm. it's like there's more to get, wrap up you get waves of satisfaction on a story level. So it does mm -hmm. kind of feel the same almost. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, yeah, do you have a favorite of the three clue endings? I love Michael McKean's delivery of I'm going home to sleep with my wife. That's pretty just, hard to stop. <laughs> that, and I just love the reveal of Mr. Green being competent. <laughs> competent and straight. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, honestly what's what's better but what's a better mr Greenman between that or in the second ending when he says mrs peacock was a man <laughs> <laughs> curry slaps him out of the frame <laughs> how michael mckean didn't get more parts where he's a bigger character after clue i don't know better call saul Oh, but for a while, but I, I won't mm -hmm. say anything past that. But <laughs> I mean, besides that, like, what was his next biggest role? Coneheads, Airheads, something with heads in it. Uh, the like the Christopher Guest movies, you could probably throw in there. Oh, true. He got an he got an Oscar nomination for A Mighty Wind. Him and Annette O'Toole's song. I keep forgetting Michael McKean's an Oscar nominee. <laughs> what what a great timeline we live in sometimes. <laughs> and with his wife, that's romantic. <laughs> but um yeah so and, and i do th I, what i do like also was i was kind of talking i got sidetracked i was talking about like the tones that knives out has mm -hmm. um where clue has like you know an underlying creepy factor at the start but then it's pretty much just 
it's not only just a comedy, but a slapstick comedy at that. That has double the body count of the serious Knives Out. Yeah, Knives Out has a body count of two. Yeah. And Clue has six or seven. Well, it depends on which ending. Body. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah, because it's and what's and what's interesting is as Clue gets further into slapstick territory, the bigger the body count gets. We get three bodies right in a row suddenly. <laughs> 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 like clue, clue clue goes fucking crazy <laughs> and the third, going to the towards the end <laughs> well, it's funny because you'd think with the body count it'd be classified as like a black comedy but i don't know if it is considered a black comedy or if it's just considered a comedy i was gonna say it's first off it is absolutely a black comedy <laughs> no question <laughs> um you would I know. know i think i feel like that's one of your favorite genres Oh yeah, if if it's done right, it can also be like there hasn't been a good black comedy that I like. Or, mm, it's would you say it, there hasn't been a good black comedy since Danny DeVito hung up the director's chair? It's it's hard <laughs> it's harder to do black comedy now because audiences can be much more cynical now. Mm-hmm. Like Ready or Not is a black comedy that everybody loves, and I can't stand it. Mm. I feel like it's like the most obvious like it's if you i just don't i don't care for it uh and it's, mm-hmm. it's a long story short it's hard to make a black comedy especially now um mm-hmm. which is great that clue has held on for so long and it's mm-hmm. still just as funny to new like it's finding new generations of audiences and hitting just as much like it's following is only growing with time which is crazy since comedy central doesn't really play it much anymore <laughs> it took me it took me a second to realize that was that was a joke i'm assuming <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, well kind of a half joke kind of half not i mean that's how we were introduced to it yeah there's a few there's a few movies i was introduced to by comedy central playing them constantly which have been brought up many times mm-hmm. but um so we're 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 kind of we're kind of bouncing around, which I th- to in my experience, people seem to prefer that when we're doing the versus thing. Mm-hmm. Just w- when I'm working alone, it's usually easier to just do one movie than the other. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think this is more what people are expecting if they don't know like these videos that we do. Mm-hmm. So um, but I get I get a little lost easier when we're going back and forth, which is why it's nice to do it with another person <laughs> mm. um we talked about we talked about a lot of the comedy and clue and we'll come back to talk more about the comedy and clue but we keep mentioning it um some of the funnier aspects of knives out because I, me- I mentioned craig is kind of the center of it mm-hmm. um and i think a lot of it comes into just how incredibly well written it is mm-hmm in the way some of the dialogue is actually we'll bleed this into clue also because both movies are so incredibly well written mm-hmm. because clues dialogue is so snappy it can be hard to keep up with mm-hmm. <laughs> like there's when i when we we were kids when we first saw it a million times and even though we saw it a million times as i got older i realized how much of the dialogue i was missing mm-hmm. <laughs> Because there's just so, especially the barbs just go so quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, like like one of the, and, and they seem so obvious when you hear them now, like when he's, um, when Wadsworth's talking to Professor Plum and he talks about how Professor Plum worked with like um, lunatics with delusions of grandeur. And he said, well, now I work with the United, United Nations. And just like it's any other piece of the conversation, just really casually, just so your job hasn't changed. And they just mm-hmm. go on to the next thing. <laughs> and they just say it like it's just so conversational that you don't mm-hmm. even like see it right away or hear it right away. Mm-hmm. And the whole and it's thing, a credit, it's a credit to the actors too to make it sound that natural. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, 
just clap back with something snappy that you didn't come up with. Yeah, like the whole th- where um, Mrs. White's talking about her husband, and they're talking about how it was a situation of life and death. Mm-hmm. She said, "Yeah, he's dead. Now I have a life." And it's just, mm-hmm. just lines like that just come and go really quickly, <laughs> mm-hmm. and they're pretty constant. Mm-hmm. Which which is especially funny because there's also um, the, the way they use silence in Clue. Mm-hmm. Be really funny also for like long stretches. I feel like Clue would have been one of those movies that it would have been fun to be on the set. Surely. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> I love, some of the silent scenes I love are, I, I love the moment when they um, break the matches to see who's going to get paired up with who. Mm-hmm. And there's just this really long scene with no dialogue where they're just trying to match the matches to each person. And this goes on, like the longer it goes on, the funnier it gets. <laughs> <laughs> And then one one of my personal favorites is it's a perfect moment of silence, and then it leads to a great slapstick moment when um, mm-hmm. they all go into um, like the lounge, I think, and they're all sitting down. Mm-hmm. And every time Mr. Green goes to sit down, somebody sits there, and the whole <laughs> scene is just him going from seat to seat, and each seat is fake. And then he just goes, and he just kind of uncomfortably leans on the table in the background Mm -hmm. and then somewhere in the middle of the scene in mid dialogue the table just collapses under (laughs) (laughs) and just every time it's such a it's such like a classic slapstick is like so easy Mm -hmm. like a lot of slapstick doesn't age well Mm -hmm. but for some reason every time that table collapses and i see michael mckean go down I'm just gone. I'm on. I'm on the fucking floor laughing. <laughs> I think. I think it was the build up because we had such a long scene of silence building up to him sitting on that table, and then it's like halfway through the scene when we're already in mid dialogue. There's some important information being thrown around, and it's interrupted by the. <laughs> That's, do you think that, like do you that. think that was on purpose or do you think like that happened accidentally and they just rolled with it? It could be. I feel like it's way too well, well choreographed, well blueprinted. <laughs> but with that cast, could you see that happening and them just being able to keep going? Yeah, because it is a cast of like consummate professionals. Mm-hmm. So it's, <laughs> which makes the silliness I think that's something that makes the silliness go a long way mm-hmm. is you have these actors that are able to do, that have basically long since mastered that stuff mm-hmm. um, like even, even that's on, why I like I think when we were younger like we used to talk about how funny it was that like stand-up comedians would be up there talking about that stuff and they're wearing a suit they're so well dressed to tell the stories they're telling yeah <laughs> I was the first person I always think of is Greg Proops. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you look you look at the cast and you have two Oscar nominees in it. Madeline Kahn mm-hmm. and Eileen Brennan. Madeline Kahn has had two Oscar nominations and Eileen Brennan had one. Mm-hmm. All three of those movies were comedies. Hmm. Are you aware that one of Madeline Kahn's nominations was Blazing Saddles? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then like you that, could take that further. Michael Michael McKean was nominated for a comedy. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I forgot to mention him. I was talking just strictly acting nominees, but yeah, there's three. Mm-hmm. And um, and so yeah, talking about um, the comedy in Knives Out now, uh, and a lot how a lot of it comes from the dialogue. Mm-hmm. One of the best lines in this movie and i I even wrote it down just to make sure i got it just right because the dialogue the dialogue in knives out is so specific Mm -hmm. it's when blanc gets his poirot moment the moment at the end of every murder mystery where the detective lays everything out i love that Mm -hmm. uh noah segan's in here also as like the fanboy for mysteries and he's like geeking out the whole time Blanc's doing this (laughs) and he's talking about how is it um Shannon's son 
is Jaden Martell, I think. The the right wing kid that hides in the bathroom and trolls people on his phone. Yeah, that's Michael Shannon's kid. And he overhears the fight between Ransom and Plummer. Mm-hmm. Harlan. I couldn't remember his name for a second. Mm-hmm. And they were trying to, there's the whole debate of what was he doing in the bathroom. And so when he's going through his big reveal, Blanc's going through his whole professional analysis of what everything means, what everything has happened up to this point. He's talking about what he overheard and his exact words are, what were the overheard words by the Nazi child masturbating in the bathroom? (laughs) (laughs) But he says it so smooth, like any other line in that scene. (laughs) like, I know you don't like his version, but only the way James Bond could just lay that out. <laughs> and it's even, and just some of Craig's deliveries in this are on such another level. <laughs> another, another great one is when he's talking, when he, when it's first revealed that he doesn't know who hired him. And he's like, I got a note saying, you know, what was going to happen and an envelope of cash. And so I showed up here and Noah Sagan's like an envelope. That's the only thing that got you here. And his response is an envelope of cash. (laughs) (laughs) Just that delivery is so perfect. (laughs) And like I was talking about, just just the dialogue is like, this is the kind of, Brian, I, I know people are all, people get into the whole Last Jedi thing. And so it's popular to hate Ryan Johnson for one movie. Um, but I mean, Ryan Johnson's kind of a genius when you look at like, it's like, obviously remember he did Looper mm-hmm. and he did some of the best episodes ever of Breaking Bad, which says something. Mm-hmm. I wasn't that into Brick, but a lot of people really love it. Um, but Ryan Johnson knows what he's doing it, with movies like this. And there is so much dialogue in this where if it came from somebody else, it would feel so try hard. Mm-hmm. But I feel like you've got this perfect thing going on, this perfect formula of Johnson's writing and the actors delivering it and the whole context of everything. Um, and it's just so, pr- and so the way things are worded, like to where they're worded almost like, it's almost like too wordy. But that's what makes it funny. Like mm-hmm. it doesn't. It doesn't sound like a writer trying to sound smart. It's. It's because it sounds the way it does. It's funny, but at the same time brilliant. Mm-hmm. Like in the first example that comes to mind is when it's revealed that Marta can't lie or even think about lying without puking, and that's her tell. Mm-hmm. And the way Blanc describes to her that he knows this, he calls it a regurgitative regurgitative reaction to mistruthing. (laughs) (laughs) And and by the way, I do think Blanc's accent plays a big part in this as well. (laughs) (laughs) Because his, his name makes him sound like French and sophisticated. But as Ransom points out many times, he has like a foghorn leghorn <laughs> thing going on. <laughs> Here's, there's one that's just really offhand that you barely even can notice. And it's when he, it's after um, the place where all the evidence is burned down. And when Blanc walks up to the scene, he walks up to Lakeith Stanfield and just says, what's the cheese? <laughs> <laughs> like of all the like he does the whole thing of regurgitative reaction to mistruthing and then on this side hey what's the cheese? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then it's i could go on all day about craig's deliveries in this there's the great one the great one that's that's turned into a great meme now <laughs> i see i see it a lot with like the meme is related to cats a lot and what cats are thinking mm-hmm. um i got like one i saw was like when you when you make like noises to cats or something like when you just see them and you just start making noises or whatever like into mm-hmm. like intelligible noises to get their attention mm-hmm. and then it was like um when you do that and then it's it's the pictures of blanc saying it makes no damn sense 
compels me though. <laughs> <laughs> so would you between this and like Logan Lucky, would you call Daniel Craig like a master of comedic delivery? I genuinely, from the bottom of my heart, 100% think that it's his strength. It, <laughs> like, comedy is his strongest quality. <laughs> so, <laughs> Which is so funny, because he just looks like a serious person. I don't know if it's his bond that's done it, but he just, he looks like he would be stone serious. And I think, I think another thing is how well- Is that well part of the comedy? Is that he looks like he'd be so serious? It, I mean, it has to be like, like maybe the bond, like I bat, like I know everybody puts him on like the highest highs on the pedestal of bond. And I'm in the, I'm very much in the minority when I say I have no passion for his bond whatsoever. I feel nothing about his bond. I would put him third personally, but. That's a, all, all this information's in another video, <laughs> mm -hmm. but um. No, the the fact that it's like his bond being so serious to a fault probably really helps strengthen what he can do with comedy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's and, I, and I'm really I am honestly that's the most ex, one of the most exciting things to me is the like the whole idea of the sequels being that it's going to be a different mystery with a different cast every time and he's the one person we're going to keep seeing he's he's like the poirot of his new of his of his own series now mm -hmm. and i find that extremely exciting seeing him in different locations with different mysteries is going to be so fucking fun and i'm so glad <laughs> we're getting it <laughs> like the, the fact that we already have a guaranteed two more movies of him i am so excited <laughs> <laughs> And I love that when we don't even like he's a mystery in himself when he shows up because mm -hmm. he's back there just hitting the piano. When Don Johnson says, who the fuck is this guy? Dropping the movie's first of two F-bombs. Mm -hmm. We're thinking the same thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess unless you saw a trailer or something, but still, uh, mm -hmm. there's something very mysterious about his character that I really love. Mm hmm but um yeah never thought i would say this but i could go on about daniel craig all day <laughs> <laughs> yeah what do you what do you think of what uh chris evans is bringing to the table <laughs> i think it's so funny that he's so pure of heart as captain america and then you get this yeah i, think I love I, I love when an actor just like veers off in another direction violently yeah like from what have they're you, doing speaking of he and shannon have you watched the ice man yet yeah i did is it he's he's so good in that too <laughs> mm -hmm. and he's he's completely off his fucking rocker in that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> i think i think one of my favorite lines in the movie and like with all this dialogue you could see is like almost sophisticated or something like that i think one of my favorite lines in the movie is when it's all coming together at the end Mm -hmm. And Ransom just tries to laugh it off and says, this is stupid with two O's. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I love that line so much. <laughs> mm. And uh, you, know, you know who else is great in this? Really, really great in this is Plummer. Mm -hmm. I am still... IP. That is that is still so upsetting to me. Mm -hmm. That like Plummer was really in a nice prime place here. And to lose to lose him in the way that we did is like so upsetting because he wasn't he didn't have health problems. He had a, he died because he had a fall. Yeah. It's like to think he, that he had he, he had, had an age problem. <laughs> yeah, he he easily would have had a few more years in him, even being 90. See, I wasn't, I didn't really know a whole lot about Christopher Plummer, but where I really started to pay attention and enjoy his work was after seeing Beginners. Yeah. I, was, I wasn't sure if you were going to say Beginners or Inside Man. Inside Man, he's there. And he doesn't really like, I mean, he's good in Inside Man, but like, 
beginners was really where I like took notice. Yeah. Like I was like, this is an actor I'm interest interested in. I want to see what what he's gonna do. <laughs> he's really good in beginners, and that it was a well deserved Oscar. I thought. Yes, I are. remember you and I watched Beginners in Athens, and after it was over, I told you I was like, that was really good. Yeah, because I really I think, liked Beginners. Yeah, because I think that started with I gotta go out of town to see this movie because Christopher Plummer's gonna probably win an Oscar for it, and it's like mm-hmm. I. I need, I need, I don't want to just go alone. Do you want to go? It's like, I don't, mm-hmm. when I asked, I don't think you even knew what Beginners was, did you? <laughs> no, and then we both left and we were like, well, if he wins it, he earned it. <laughs> and it's the way, and the way he's so, especially his relationship with Marta and how in such little time, it makes such perfect sense that she's the only name in the will. Mm-hmm. when you see how much they connect it's not, and what's then, funny is if, if you look at his character in inside man he fits right in with that family yeah but if you look at like how he is in the actual movie like he is the warmest presence in the movie yeah it's almost like i think that's what makes those scenes so appealing is the juxtaposition of seeing what the family's like mm-hmm. and then seeing what he's like especially with her mm-hmm and it's like even even when we get to the point when he when he's under the impression that he's dying and he's like so and he's like just going through all the things like he's writing a new novel he's even writing down novel ideas while it's happening mm-hmm. <laughs> and then it's just just the way he's so like calm he, he's so calm and warm about it even when it's a situation like that where it's like um when it's like she's only supposed to give him three and she gave him a hundred mm-hmm. and when she reveals that he's like oh that's much less that is, yeah. <laughs> that's much less than it's supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> and and he stays it, calm, cool, and collected all the way up. And, I and think then that's, later we realized the reason that part of the reason he was so cool, calm, and collected was because nothing was going on. Yeah. And it's like that's that's another great tone that the movie juggles is there's so much tragedy in his storyline. <laughs> Mm-hmm. like it's his whole like when it's happening then like when we think she accidentally injected him with the wrong thing it's incredibly mm-hmm. tragic and incredibly sad and then it's that like tenfold when we realize what actually happened mm-hmm. yeah and it's like when it's like when Blanc tells her like you didn't kill him because you're good at your job yeah <laughs> that's a that's a great craig moment also Mm-hmm. Like it's it's so jarring to see Daniel Craig emote. It's crazy. <laughs> it's like what what dimension is this? <laughs> but there was a lot of people talking. And when I was talking about that interview at the dinner table that they had, mm-hmm. and Craig was like really into talking about the movie and talking about the character. And they said like when you watch interviews where he's doing like Bond movies or something. He is just, you can't get anything out of him. He's just so done with it. He's just so sick of it. Mm-hmm. But when he's when he's being interviewed for a movie he's really into, you can like see that that's that those characters you can see an actor that those characters could conceivably come out of. For him, it's like when Tom Holland talks about Spider Man. <laughs> okay. Like people yeah. were having to tackle him in the back to not give too much away. And it's like God, God forbid we get to the point where he plays Benoit Blanc so many times. <laughs> he's do- <laughs> he's doing those stone-faced interviews again about yeah, I'm playing this fuck again. <laughs> <laughs> but sure, surely this will leave this character has plenty uh, that he won't grow tired of. <laughs> I wonder if when he like signed on, he thought he was going to be more of like a Roger Moore type. That could... <laughs> so you're saying so you're saying bond is the reason we have such an emotionless daniel craig just in total because <laughs> <laughs> we we always like to throw out road to perdition also when he was a bit more of a like an animated villain kind of mm-hmm. and tintin even though he's he's literally animated it's still like motion capture so yeah mm-hmm. yeah it's like just just unleash him and let him do it and daniel craig can be fine <laughs> <laughs> even when he's playing characters that are supposed to be totally in control like Blanc mm-hmm. 
he can still have a lot mm-hmm. of fun with it. Mm-hmm. His whole donut monologue. He has two donut monologues, actually. <laughs> <laughs> when he's just when he's just rocking out in the car like Chad Feldheimer, and then like the ambulance pulls up behind him. <laughs> I just love that you compare Belong to Chad Feldheimer. <laughs> I mean, is that not exactly what that scene is? <laughs> I feel like you wanted to do this video just to make that comparison. <laughs> Yeah, because this is all stuff I couldn't talk about before. <laughs> I mean, you could have talked about Chad Feldheimer. <laughs> and then there's um, really just the rest of the cast. What do you, like, I love, um, you know, it's a really great scene for a really specific reason. Mm-hmm. And not just because it makes the family feel especially real. Because mm-hmm. obviously, you know, bickering families are something anybody can relate to. But the mm-hmm. but these people are like especially vile. <laughs> so there's that mm-hmm. moment. Remember the moment when they're talking about politics. Our conversations you can see all over the internet. It just happens to be a conversation between Don Johnson and Tony Collette. <laughs> And I, mm-hmm. and, I, and I love the details of Tony Collette saying stuff like uh, when she hears about Blanc and she says, uh, oh, yeah, I read a tweet about an article about you. About that, that whole thing mm-hmm. where nobody just reads now or gets their information. They just read the headline. The headlines come from headlines, come from articles. And people only mm-hmm. see what's up here. And they're just going back and forth. And then Don Johnson's talking about how, you know, it's great that Marta did everything legally and stuff like that. And how it's like, he's basically saying that because she, her and her family, unbeknownst to <laughs> what he thinks, um, they came over here legally. And then it's like him basically saying like, oh, Mar- Marta's on our level now. Like Marta is one of us. She's an equal to us. But then when he turned- even though Even though they all think she's from a different country. Yeah. But when he turns- to talk to Tony Collette again, he hands mm-hmm. Marta his plate without even looking at her. When mm-hmm. she's when she's the fucking nurse. <laughs> yeah. And it's like just that that whole disconnect of like trying to basically trying to build it up strictly for his argument. Yeah, she's one of us. But then it's like he doesn't actually think that. <laughs> yeah. And then that really all comes crashing down when they realize that she's gonna get the money. Yeah. And that, I like that. I like that thing also about how, like, the fact of her mom being here illegally mm-hmm. is something they just kind of put in there. And how it's just basically the plot. Mm-hmm. Like, it's, it's eventually how, like, it's how Shannon tries to blackmail her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, like, all of that comes into play of if she gets found out, like, if they think she had something to do with Harlan's death, that's going to be the end of her mom. <laughs> yeah and the way that that like just that one detail they just kind of say oh by the way that is suddenly the whole stakes and it's like the the way mm-hmm. the writing in this just kind of keeps building into all these different directions mm-hmm. is crazy <laughs> and i love the shot at the end where she's like pulling away and like the family is just there like just like staring her down yeah <laughs> It's a, it's genuinely terrifying when we get like point of view shots of everybody looking at her. Mm-hmm. When uh, Fr- Frank Oz comes in to read the will. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, and it's funny because you think like it seems like the most redeemable character is Jamie Lee Curtis, and then she turns on a dime too. As soon as the will's read, she's like scary <laughs> yeah and the scene even the the scene where she's surrounded in the car mm-hmm. <laughs> i love there's a moment in there i didn't realize until the last time i watched it <laughs> mm-hmm. but obviously um one of shannon's legs is out of commission and he has to walk with a cane mm-hmm. <laughs> and there's that shot of his son recording everything with his phone Mm-hmm. And out, when they're all crowding around her car out of focus off to the right you can see shannon hobbling up to the car and he's going i can't catch up <laughs> <laughs> it's 
It's like even <laughs> even despite being held back, they're all that vulture mentality. Like they mention, he mentions at the end that they're vultures, and obviously that's that's what you call people like them. But it's like to see it so literal <laughs> when they just come down on her. Yeah, is it's a it's a terrifying fucking thing. I'm very curious to see how he ups the ante with the new characters in the sequels. Mm-hmm. And uh, while we have all of those people involved, where like I said, all of those people could be guilty of something terrible. Mm-hmm. And and that's kind of, that kind of throws a wrench in things a little bit. Where Ransom's the one that gets her out of that situation, mm-hmm. even even though his plan is falling into place at the same time. <laughs> Mm-hmm. um the people in clue what do you think of little... what do you think of it before we move over to clue what do you think of the twist where we find out that fran said hugh did this instead of you did this it's one of those things where once it's revealed you feel like an idiot <laughs> because it feels so obvious like every time i watch knives out back now it's like how the fuck didn't i see that because <laughs> you weren't looking for it yeah, and they even is they even when even when it, he it, says the would line, that be the would that be the movie equivalent of hiding it in plain sight? Yeah, probably. Mm-hmm. I, I was just getting ready to bring up uh, one of the things that she calls attention to is when um, when Blanc sees him for the first time and he walks by, and they say, you know, like you know, Hugh Thrombey, and he just says, "No, only the help calls me Hugh." Mm-hmm. It's like it's right there. <laughs> <laughs> Like that one line is setting up the reveal later. <laughs> and it's there's something I'm trying to remember what it is. There's something that Marta says that I think really sells it and kind of takes it away. Because if as soon as you throw something at the audience, you want to do at least a little something that they won't notice to kind of throw them off the scent. Mm-hmm. So when she says Hugh did this. I'm, I can't remember exactly what it is. Marta says something where it's like she like she says it back to her. Mm-hmm. And it's like in this way to where it's like you you can see once you know the mechanics of it, you can see how he how Ryan Johnson hit it. Mm-hmm. Um but man, it's it's right there in the open. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know that I've ever heard anybody say that they picked up on it. Mm-hmm. But you, you know, usually you have those people that want to sound like the smartest person in the world that say, "Oh, I knew everything going in," which mm-hmm. are more more often than not full of shit. But there are people that can figure out things pretty early. But um, things are really expertly placed in this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, yeah, like we were saying, where everybody in this looks like they could be very much a suspect. And some, like I said, we know what happened to Harlan. It's a matter of what other bad shit is coming into play and who's doing it. Mm -hmm. And everybody looks like they could be guilty of something. And they probably, like, we investigate one thing. Mm -hmm. Um, But they're probably all, like, Richard obviously is um, doing the whole cheating thing. Mm -hmm. It took me a while. Well, it's also set up, like, the way that it's done, the way that it starts, it's set up as just purely an accident. Speaking of accidents, there was something that I noticed on like my third time watching it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, This is one of those things where you can see the details the more you watch it. I'm I'm still wondering what other stuff I might be missing. But um, speaking of things that happen by accident, have you by any chance noticed that Don Johnson outed himself for the cheating? No in a very roundabout way Hmm. but you remember harlan left her the note Mm -hmm. and richard went in and when he looked at the note it it appeared to be a blank piece of paper Mm -hmm. and then when jamie lee curtis finds it she figures out when you burn it you can see what it says Mm -hmm. when richard sees the blank piece of paper remember he gets frustrated and he throws he takes the baseball off the desk and throws it out the window Mm -hmm. At the end of the movie, the reason Jamie Lee Curtis finds the note is because she's bringing the baseball back. Ah, oh. so he how how amazing is that? <laughs> and what's interesting too is you take a character that is so 
vulture hungry like Jamie Lee Curtis wants the letters read and she uses something sentimental for that reveal. Yeah. Like her human side comes out to find that secret out. It's like when she decides to be human and have emotions, she gets rewarded for it. Yeah. You know, when she wants to be a scheming vulture, it's thrown in her face. Or it blows up in her face. Yeah, it's like... As far as them basically being the villains of the... Like, obviously, it all comes down to Ransom. But in a sense, they're all kind of villains. <laughs> mm-hmm. And there's that shot where they make um, Meg... I think it's Catherine Langford's character. They make her call her and say, like, you know, try to convince her to give the money back or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then there's the reveal that she was being forced to when she hangs up and she turns and the whole family's behind her just watching. Yeah. They look like they're in fucking Get Out. (laughs) They look look like they'd be doing, like, Jamie Lee Curtis was giving me serious Bradley Whitford vibes in that show. (laughs) I can be you saying that i could even see jamie lee curtis's character saying i voted for obama three times (laughs) but yeah the um the cast of clue doesn't like who would you say is the biggest like because because nine down has ransom where it's like there's always the person that seems obvious does clue have that character do you think I mean, there is there is the classic cliche, the butler did it, mm-hmm. which eventually comes true in the last ending. And it's like, are we, but I can't, I don't know, Clue, because Clue is very interesting in itself and how it plays up what's going on, especially with, mm-hmm. especially when Mr. Body's body disappears. Mm-hmm. It kind of takes us off the path we're kind of expecting. And then when his body reappears, <laughs> mm-hmm. it's like Clue's playing its own games. Like Clue doesn't completely play by the rules either. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's um, and it kind of has, even though it has all the classic vibes, like it has the whole thing where um, like that very Agatha Christie thing of all the characters realize they're connected to each other. Mm-hmm. Like, and knives out, they're all family. That's easy. Um, but a lot, a lot of the mystery of Clue is how they, how they know each other. Yeah, because isn't that set? If I remember right, that's set up in the beginning. Like they say, you all are connected somehow. Yeah, and a, a lot of like them. There's a reason Mr. you are all here. Yeah, and a, a lot of them know Mrs. Peacock specifically because she's like a senator's wife. Mm-hmm. And there's even that. Um, and I, I really love Eileen Brennan's performance in this, by the way. Like Madeline Kahn's the one that always gets singled out, and for good reason. Mm-hmm. Like the the flames thing is like iconic, <laughs> <laughs> but Eileen Brennan has a really great scene here when she's talking about like because uh, she obviously she has to play frantic a lot, mm-hmm. which constant makes her performance even cooler when in the second ending it's revealed that it's her. Mm-hmm. Um, but how she's she's the one that's like overly talky. But then once things start going to shit, she's like out of control. Mm -hmm. And I love the juxtaposition where she's on the couch after everything's gone to shit. And she's saying like, you know, I'm an, my life's an open book. I've never done anything wrong. I haven't done anything wrong. But when she's saying that her, like her glasses are off and she looks so like weathered, Mm -hmm. like she, she looks incredibly guilty of something. The Mm -hmm. more she says, I haven't done anything wrong. (laughs) <laughs> and I, lo- I thought she played that really well and it's like in the way you can have characters like that and then have characters that are completely unassuming like mr green <laughs> <laughs> and i love that there's the only bit the only big reveal mr green has is the opposite that he's the like he's the most trustworthy <laughs> <laughs> um like i love the moment when he first shows up and walter's talking to the dogs and yells sit and Mr. Green sits down on that bench there. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of good stuff. The, the timing of Mr. Green's comedy as well, like his bumbling. 
um, where it's like, like there'll be just like this perfectly timed crack of thunder or when he like keeps just spilling his drinks on people. And <laughs> <laughs> like this, this is the kind of stuff that would be too over the top in another movie when you have so many professional people here doing this thing. Because we, we talked a lot about Ryan Johnson and Knives Out. Um, Jonathan Lynn wrote and directed this. Mm-hmm. The guy that did the whole nine yards. And he, do, he does not have a perfect filmography. You know, mm-hmm. you, know, you know my love, my endless, endless love for Emily Blunt. Mm-hmm. I'll be the first to tell you, Jonathan Lynn made one of her worst movies. <laughs> mm-hmm. Which was also a black comedy. So he's he's hit and miss, especially as far as black comedy goes. But when he hits the black comedy bullseye, you get clue and you get the whole nine yards. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and like I said, the the balance here of the characters and the slapstick, but also the fact that, like like I was saying, how when we get to the point where the bodies are stacking up at a rate to where we can't even keep up anymore. Like I, lo- I really love when the cop comes to the door and by then we've got a whole stack of bodies and Wadsworth is trying to remember which rooms the bodies are in. Mm-hmm. So when the cop says, I need to use your phone, Wadsworth's like running through the rooms in his head <laughs> before he tells him where the phone is. <laughs> so question, question, let's combine the two things. Let's say instead of 19, well, Clue came out, what, 85? Yeah. Let's say instead of 85, it was made in 95. Could you totally see Matthew Perry playing Mr. Green? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, cause Oz has a lot of slapstick in the whole nine yards. Mm-hmm. See, Especially runs, like when he falls through the table. When he runs through the in, in, in whole nine yards, when he runs into the screen door. That's, mm-hmm. a, that's something Mr. Green would do. <laughs> And the, I could see him doing little flip outs at the thunder, like the scene where Matthew Perry reacts to the phone ringing. <laughs> I, could, I could see him delivering Mrs. Peacock was a man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could see him being like really triumphant in Mr. Green's ending. <laughs> Another great Mr. Green moment is uh, I had to stop her screaming. <laughs> <laughs> I love, um, I kind of, I really just love, um, there is a movie, I think it's this movie, um, Pretty Maids All in a Row, which is an incredible black comedy with Rock Hudson that I Mm -hmm. really highly recommend. Tarantino loves it as well. And there's a scene in that, I really hope I'm remembering the right movie (laughs) after I just praised it. It's like, I hope this is the right scene. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, There is a dead body in a, in a bathroom stall and a line that comes out of this is oh it's okay they're dead <laughs> and i was thinking i was thinking about that when it comes to the scene when um there when uh, mr body has died twice now mm-hmm. and they're getting ready to move from room to room and they're like wait a minute okay good there's still two bodies let's <laughs> it's like oh two corpses we're good let's keep going <laughs> Here, I've got I've got a fun idea for you. I'm gonna expand on. <laughs> Clue is made in 1995, and Matthew Perry plays Mr. Green, and Tom Hanks plays Professor Plum. I could see that. I'm trying to I'm trying to remember some of Mr. Plum's standout scenes. <laughs> I like them. I think I think his best moment might have to be um, when he's when he's being wishy washy in the last ending about whether or not he killed Mr. Body. Mm-hmm. You know, and everything's re- when it's revealed that Curry is Mr. Body, he says, "Wait a minute, then who did I kill?" <laughs> and then when when he says, "My butler," he's just like, "Oh shucks." <laughs> I just love that we got Professor Plum the same year we got Doc Brown. Oh yeah, I don't know that that ever occurred to me until just now. <laughs> we we literally just established Clues 1985, and for some reason it didn't register. <laughs> I think that's how good because I mean Christopher Lloyd is kind of a chameleon. Yeah. Like like I mean I know he's a legend, but I don't know that he's gotten quite enough credit for 
for how much of a chameleon he can be. Yeah, because four years later, he's one of the most sinister villains ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I was talking about too, where like... That's another year we got a, we got a version of Doc Brown. Yeah. <laughs> And that's you got the Judge thing, Doom man. and Old West Doc Brown in the same year. <laughs> and that's that's the thing is um, when I was talking about how Clue actually, if you don't know what you're in for, Clue's beginning is kind of creepy. Mm-hmm. That scene where Miss Scarlet's broken down on the side of the road, and then Professor Plum's car like comes out of the dark. Mm-hmm. That's like a horror movie scene. <laughs> mm-hmm. that's it like, that's up to be like a suspense thriller. And then once the and then once we have the dead body, that's when all the comedy kicks in. Yeah. (laughs) And there's and there's all like the the terror shots when when they pull up to the house, Mm -hmm. and then like there's like thunder and lightning behind the castle. Mm -hmm. Like doesn't Miss Scarlet draw attention to like it stopped raining or something? And then he says like yeah, it's scared. (laughs) (laughs) Like they're setting up a horror movie. Let's not, don't forget, this is the second time that Tim Curry's been hanging out in a sinister castle during a thunderstorm. Yeah. <laughs> it always works ten, out well for him. Ten years prior. Yeah. And then, uh, and I really that's love how... That's what's really funny, too, is like, Tim Curry is so good at being sinister. Like, if this wanted to go in a sinister direction, Tim Curry was a good choice. For the comedic direction it went in, Tim Curry was a good choice yeah because it's like another thing about this movie that's so legendary (laughs) especially when it comes to the ending is the whole thing we were talking about how Benoit Blanc gets his Poirot moment because there's Mm -hmm. a moment at the end of every murder mystery where they go through every single step and the fact that Wadsworth has his Poirot moment in the most over-the-top fashion (laughs) (laughs) It's like you can tell that's basic. That's basically a parody. Wouldn't you say that's easily an intentional parody of the Poirot moment? I would say so. Yeah. And I love, and I love when they start like partaking. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's like the uh, it's it's like the parody that was done before East Ventura did it nine years later. <laughs> and let's not let's not forget Ace Ventura has done it twice, <laughs> including once in reverse. Have we praised Martin Mull yet? <laughs> I don't think so. There's a couple of moments here that I love with him. He has, he gets some interesting serious moments mm-hmm. as more things are revealed about his character. But he also gets moments like one of my favorite moments is a physical moment. And that's the thing too, is like all of them have their great moments of like witty dialogue. And then they all get their moments of like slapstick or just physical comedy. Mm-hmm. Another one, remember how I said the way Mr. Green falls when the mm-hmm. table collapses gets me every time? Mm-hmm. Another one that gets me every single time is the first time the chandelier gets shot. Mm-hmm. And he says, I can't take any more scares. And then the chandelier drops behind him. Very obvious comedy beat. He says, I can't take any more scares and then a scare happens, naturally. That's Mm -hmm. the formula. But the way he falls into that chair, (laughs) (laughs) like like his whole body just stops. (laughs) It's it's such a great moment of physical comedy. (laughs) Because it's literally like, it's like he was dead for a fraction of a second. <laughs> and he just falls straight into the chair. <laughs> mm. But then you get, there's also little moments he has here and there, like um, when they're piecing together everything and Walter's trying to get them towards, um, like everybody was connected, including Yvette and the cook and everybody. Mm-hmm. So when he says, um, when he's putting that together and Colonel Mustard's trying to follow along and he says, so whoever knew the cook was the one that killed her? And Wadsworth says, yes. He has that, he's so proud of himself. (laughs) (laughs) Like he he looks at everybody else. (laughs) Uh, 
that's that's I think that's what Martin Mull did really well here was a lot of small moments like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, I mean, I guess you could call it a big moment when he falls into the chair. <laughs> <laughs> Is that his uh, his magnum opus for the movie? <laughs> and then I was trying to remember she's the only one we haven't really touched on much yet. Um, I was trying to remember some of Miss Scarlet's standout moments. I think she, I think she's really good in her ending mm-hmm. when she when she gets to be the killer. Mm-hmm. Like it feels like that. But I don't know. I I like the idea of um, when you see like the title cards that tell us like that was one ending, but here's this one, and then the third ending is this is what really happened. Mm-hmm. It does kind of feel like the third one is more of like a real ending because mm-hmm. like they all partook in it and. The big twist of Wazza being Mr. Boy seems like something that seems like something that fits when you watch the whole movie. Yeah. Like, like something that would have always been there. But I don't I could actually I was talking before about how I don't feel like I'd be satisfied with just one ending. Um, but I could see the Miss Scarlet ending being like the ending of a movie. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, I don't want to sell her short because the whole ensemble is so great, but it's like mm-hmm. she may not have as many standout moments as like she's she has very um like those very catty line deliveries throughout. Mm-hmm. Um, where I, where I was talking about where like all the dialogue is like so snappy, you have to struggle to keep up with it sometimes. She's got a lot of barbs in there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, I'm trying to remember if there was any other specific points I wanted to hit. Um, do you have any? No, I think we pretty well covered both. I, I have one more Mrs. White line that I like, which was um, when they're talking about the possibility of her being the killer because there's all, they're all speculative that she may have killed her husband. Mm-hmm. And somebody asks, how many husbands have you had? And her response is, mine are other women's. <laughs> yeah, it's so so full of great dialogue that i never caught uh oh. growing up and it's uh, honestly just thinking about it as a movie based on a board game seems a little ridiculous like even though the board game sets itself up to be like a full story mm-hmm. um the idea of taking the game and using it as like a writing prompt Mm-hmm. like we had a um we had an assignment in ninth grade english when we were doing creative writing and each each of us was given a different list of like five items mm-hmm. and we had to write a story that incorporated those five items mm-hmm. it's like to basically treat the board game like that and then write a script is like a really cool idea <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. and you can see where it could go wrong i mean look at battleship yeah, I think I think it's on the verge of dying if it's not already dead, but or maybe not. I don't know because I'm not really paying attention because I don't care. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> there is apparently another adaptation of the game in the works by Ryan Reynolds. Of Clue. Mm-hmm. And I've made my opinions of Ryan Reynolds clear. To me, that is not good news. And I can see exactly where it could fail. The one thing that had me was Jason Bateman was supposed to be in it. Oh, he better be Mr. Green. I heard one, I heard they were going to do something else entirely. And the other thing I heard was Jason Bateman would be Mr. Green. But then I'm he'd have to be if they're going that route. But I am pretty sure Bateman has dropped out since. Oh, <laughs> so any any goodwill it had is already gone. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I can't remember if that's dead or still moving along or what, or if it's just paused mm-hmm. indefinitely. I have no idea. But when I see Clue and I see Ryan Reynolds, I am not particularly hyped. Certainly not as hyped as I am for Knives Out Two and Three. <laughs> but and I don't even know that you could. Can you recapture the magic of this 
with this cast because i don't want to like i'm one of those i'm not one of those anti-remake people i've said this a billion times Mm-hmm. You can you can take a story and tell it in a different way, and it can be just as fun or just as good, or maybe even sometimes better. But there's just something so specific, so lightning in a bottle about Clue, this movie, mm-hmm. that it's like another attempt just seems like it would be a lost cause. Mm-hmm. It's like there's so many talented and funny people working now, but like you can't do the type of humor that's in Clue now. Because like I was saying, slapstick is dated at this point. Mm -hmm. You have to be really, 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 really fucking good to pull off slapstick now and have to have the comedic background of a Christopher Lloyd or a Martin Maul or Michael McKean. Mm -hmm. And you got to have the perfect, perfect deliveries of a Madeline Kahn or an Eileen Brennan in that real sharp quality that Leslie Ann Warren brings. Mm-hmm. Leslie Ann Warren's also an Oscar nominee. Mm. Victor Victoria. Ah. <laughs> I hope anybody who's a stickler for the Oscar stuff that saw us that portion of us talking about that gets to this part and realizes that i caught myself (laughs) what if you were gonna remake clue today what who would you consider like who do you think might have the the gumption to do jason bateman was a great star (laughs) (laughs) what if you did like what if wadsworth was like gary oldman I could see. I mean, I mean, there's not much Gary Oldman can't do. Mm-hmm. God, who would be a modern day Tim Curry? That's the million dollar question. And I hope no. I mean, no. <laughs> I mean, let's be real. The obvious answer is unavailable. I mean, couldn't you see Daniel Craig being Wadsworth? <laughs> I was gonna. Say, I was gonna say I didn't want a smart ass answer like Bill Skarsgård. <laughs> Do you know what could be fun? He's a little older than Martin Mole was when he did it, but I think it could be interesting to see like Michael Caine do Colonel Mustard. Yeah, I could see. I could see younger Michael Caine doing it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I get. I could see Michael Caine as I could see Michael Caine as Professor Plum too. <laughs> mm-hmm. Maybe yeah. more so Professor Plum, and then Colonel Mustard would be like Josh Brolin. Yeah, so let's not forget Sleuth. Mm-hmm. Sleuth proved to us. I know it's a spoiler for a movie from the seventies, but Michael Caine. I've got a. I've got a Wadsworth for you. I think. He's not British. Downey. Yeah. Downey's in that place in his career though, where it's like every every part he would take would be too obvious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was getting ready to say Sleuth proved to us that Michael Caine can play more than one role in a murder mystery. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so let's have Michael Caine play everybody. <laughs> you know who else I think would make a good Mr. Green is uh Ewan McGregor. Yeah. Actually, you know what? You might be able to plug you and McGregor into Colonel Mustard. <laughs> I can see. There's a movie where you and McGregor wear similar glasses to Mr. Green, and I can't place it. Mm. Was it the. I've got, I've got your Professor Plum, I think. Mm. What if you went with Jim Broadbent? Yeah. I could definitely see Jim Brobin in here somewhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> maybe Jim Brod, maybe Jim Brobin is Mr. Body. That'd be interesting. Mm-hmm. Like I could see him giving the really sinister speech, but having like the slapstick comedy of being a dead body. Yeah, it'd be very. He'd be visiting a lot of hot, revisiting a lot of hot fuzz material. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Yeah, this is stuff. I really struggle with this recasting stuff. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I don't, I don't, it's not that, you know, the people today are less. Especially, especially a movie like this where you'd have to get the chemistry just right. Yeah, I think that's like the you thing. Can't, I can't you sh- can't just throw a lot of names at it and expect it to work. Which is what most people do. Mm-hmm. It was like I saw I saw one discussion once where it was like it was on a forum and they were like, if you were to recast Amy Adams in the master, who would you cast? Mm-hmm. And through answers on the forum, it was basically a list of every current working actress. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Like that's what most people do. They just throw names out. So, but it's like we were saying the whole time. This cast is so specific. And so I've got, so I've got one that might work for you. Hmm. I got I got a cast a casting choice that might work for you. What if Kathy Bates was Mrs. Peacock? I can definitely see that. <laughs> that's probably the that's probably the one that's most. Apart from Jason Bateman as Mr. Green, that's probably the most vivid I can see of what we've said so far. Mm -hmm. Man, this is such, it's such a hard thing to replicate. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, I don't, like I said, I'm not normally this way with the idea of remakes. Mm -hmm. And it's not even necessarily to be a remake of this movie, it'd be another version of the game. But still, it's like, I can't imagine it working the way this does. Like, I just can't get my mind there. Mm-hmm. I would be, If it came out, I would be open. I would try to be open. But mm-hmm. as of, like right now, I just can't imagine another clue that works as well as this one. <laughs> mm-hmm. because, because of the cast. Yeah. Like, I can't. I don't know. I'm, I'm, for some reason, I'm starting to think about uh, Patrick Stewart being in there somewhere. Like I could say, I, I have could... an idea for I have an idea for a younger Mister Body that it would be. It'd be fun to watch them be slapstick as a dead body. <laughs> what if you got somebody like Chris Hemsworth? Oh, somebody, somebody like like what they did with Depp from Murder on the Orient Express, where they got somebody to be the face, and then they end up being the corpse. Yeah, the person that's there to sell the movie is the corpse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That'd be fun. Mm-hmm. Or even if you didn't do that, I mean, you, what if you went with somebody like Colin Farrell as Mister Body? I can definitely see that. Mm-hmm. It's kind of sad to think about now because it can't happen due to circumstances. But I feel like somebody else that would be a really good Mr. Body would have been Kevin Spacey. Definitely would have had the sinister quality. <laughs> mm-hmm. But my favorite choice now might be Colin Farrell. Because <laughs> I was kind of leaning Mr. Body when I was thinking of Patrick Stewart. But Patrick Stewart could also be like Professor Plum pretty easily. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I feel like there's there's a lot of that. You were talking about with like young Michael Caine, where it's like there's some people you can imagine. Like it's hard to imagine a lot of people, but the people that you can imagine, you could imagine in multiple roles. Mm-hmm. Hell, you could throw Ian McKellen in there too. Ian McKellen would probably make a good professor for him. Yeah. I have another good Mr. Body. It's so crazy that a small part like Mr. Body, there's so many possibilities. Like, what if like Peter Dinklage was Mr. Body? I could see that, but Death at a Funeral kind of already had the idea of using him as a and he he obviously ended up not being a corpse, but for most of the movie they thought he was a corpse and they had to keep moving him. Mm-hmm. It'd be a good callback to Death at a Funeral. I was also like, yeah, that's the thing is like every time something sounds good, you realize it's only because of another role. Like, like mm-hmm. Ray, Fine, Ray Fines comes to mind for Wadsworth, but he'd just be doing what he was doing in the Grand Budapest Hotel. Yeah. So it's like, and you and you want to kind of do it to where it's like it's somebody that hasn't done exactly this before. 
Mm -hmm. But it's no, still not I've real. got your Professor Plum. I've got your Professor Plum. <laughs> is this is this as good as Kathy Bates as Mrs. Peacock? <laughs> it might be close. Professor Plum is Christoph Waltz. Yeah, I could see that. We definitely know he's got the smoking the pipe down. <laughs> mm -hmm. Waltz is another one where I could see him as a couple of characters. Mm -hmm. Waltz, Waltz will be a good Mr. Body. I could see I could even see Waltz as Wadsworth based on like his SNL performance. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Because when I'm, someone, when I'm else thinking I, Waltz, someone else I could see is like maybe not now, but let's go back maybe about 10 years ago. Another good Mr. Green would have been somebody like Greg Kinnear. Yeah. <laughs> actually, I mean, not that Greg Kinnear couldn't do it now, but. Actually, by, before I say this, <laughs> mm -hmm. by all accounts, Greg Kinnear seems like a nice guy. Mm -hmm. And by all accounts, I have heard that Greg Kinnear is a nice guy. Mm -hmm. That said, for some reason, <laughs> When I think of him as Professor Plum, I can find myself thinking, he seems like the kind of guy that would be a doctor and have affairs with his patient. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I think that, <laughs> but I can see it. <laughs> I could also, for another Mr. Body choice, I could see like Andy Garcia. <laughs> That'd be cool. Mm -hmm. Has Andy Garcia done much comedy? He did a movie in 2010 called City Island that was pretty good. He has my favorite line in the 2016 Ghostbusters. <laughs> um, what, I was, what I was just thinking was we were toying with the idea. Uh, and we're we're kind of off now on, a, on another thing. Like This is with the idea that a, not this thing that Ryan Reynolds is doing necessarily, just we're talking about the hypothetical of a movie that is a direct remake of this movie. So let's say that's what we're talking about. Just for the sake of fun, mm -hmm. do you cast just a random nobody or do you cast a really big name for the singing telegram girl? <laughs> Hmm. But don't don't like it, it would be like a cameo it wouldn't be like in they wouldn't be on the poster or anything or in the credits or anything it'd just be a really brief cameo <laughs> huh. and and i feel like it'd be lame to pick somebody that actually sings it has to be it would have to be somebody totally random <laughs> what if it was like emma stone yeah like that i can see that mm -hmm. i've got your colonel mustard Jeff Bridges. Yeah, I could see that. We're still we're still praying for a full recovery. I haven't heard anything for a while, but the last thing I heard was good news. It better be. It's Jeff Bridges. Hey, let's hope it stays that way. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, wouldn't that be amazing if they opened the door and Emma Stone was there, and before you had time to register, hey, that's Emma Stone. She's there. <laughs> <laughs> And Emma Stone seems fun enough that she would do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. You could do the same thing with uh, with the cop that comes to investigate that gets whacked with the phone. You could do like, what if that was like Forrest Whitaker? I was going to say, it'd make the most sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to stick to the joke, mm -hmm. Re Reginald Vell Johnson. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> But the question is, would all these people gel together? I could see Kathy Bates and Jason Bateman gelling. But I feel like Kathy Bates could gel with just about anybody. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the key. But you can also bring in like character actors. Like, um, you know who I could see as multiple like i can see his colonel mustard and i can see his mr green is somebody like stephen root yeah 
What if for, what if for Professor Plum you got somebody like Paul Giamatti? Yeah, that's and that's what sucks about these guys that are so great because Giamatti falls into that Downey camp, mm -hmm. where he'd be great, but he'd be so great it's it's almost too predictable, like it's too mm -hmm. obvious. It's just like like any fan casting that involves Brolin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course he'd be amazing, but a little obvious. <laughs> I, I think I found somebody I like better for Mr. Body even than Colin Farrell. Hmm. Clive Owen. Yeah, I could see that. Mm -hmm. I could easily, I don't know why this is. I can easily see Clive Owen as like Professor Plum too. It'd be kind of fun to see him get like kind of nerdy. Yeah, because because I'm a, I'm imagining him with his born identity glasses, which is hilarious. Because we're we're talking about nerdy when he's a fucking assassin in the born identity. Mm -hmm. There is um I, well he well, yeah we saw in his curb episode that he can do comedy really well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now that now that you've said that, I want Larry David as Professor Plum. <laughs> I'm I'm going back to the Michael Caine thing. If Larry David's going to be in this, he needs to be everybody. <laughs> I'd love I'd love to see him as Walter, just because I love I love the idea of a butler that doesn't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I just I, think I just had this. <laughs> What's that? I think the only two we haven't touched is like Mrs. White and Miss Scarlet. Mrs. White would be really hard. Mm -hmm. Madeline, Madeline Kahn really like planted a Madeline Kahn flag in that role. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that would be like, like look, just no, nobody's coming to me right now. They can fit that. I mean, I know, I'm sure they're out there. Mm -hmm. Off the top of my head, I I can't even get my mind there. <laughs> now, the only person that comes to mind for me, and she's a little young, I think, is like a Rose Byrne or something like that. Yeah, yeah. When you think about Rose Byrne and Spy, mm -hmm. would be real like would be a really good. Maybe she heart. might be better for Miss Scarlet, actually. Yeah, well, uh, Miss Scarlet's another hard one. Mm -hmm. God, it really makes... that's that's the thing I love though about it being so hard to recast is it just highlights how great the cast is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because if you could easily replace them, then it loses its magic. Yeah, because we could do this for two more hours, mm -hmm. and I think we'd always get stuck at they have to gel with each other. Mm -hmm. so um i may just surrender Kni knives out is kind of the same way but i think knives out leans a little more on its writing than clue does like clue needed the clever writing but it also needed the expert delivery yeah and it's, and it's good you say that um there's another thing that i sometimes don't do or forget to do and it gets people a little bit out of shape because these apparently matter, these videos matter apparently, um, mm -hmm. is choosing between the two. Mm -hmm. And on like a writing perspective and an execution perspective, like it's hard to not say clue for cast, mm -hmm. but overall I would say Knives Out is a better movie. And I really only have one reason. While Knives Out is constantly clever and constantly mm -hmm. unraveling and constantly going in these new directions, I feel like Clue kind of grinds to like the the um the slapstick is fun and the slapstick is very funny. And like I said, we have an expert cast. Mm -hmm. we, have, we haven't really um called out uh, Colin Camp either, um for for having a very a role that's meant to not be that dimensional, but she definitely brings a comedic factor and can stand with the rest of the cast mm -hmm. um 
with that said, I think Clue kind of grinds to a halt when they start searching the house. Do you think the fact that it's only one, it all takes place in one location hurts it after a while? I feel like you can work with that, especially since they recreated the board. Mm -hmm. like, to, like to the point that the secret passages even go to the same rooms that they do on the in the board game. Mm -hmm. um, but I, just after a while, I feel like it kind of wears thin when they're wandering around the house for a while. Do you feel like it's just kind of like like we have to wade through this to get to the climax so the movie's not too short. Yeah, because I think because in total it says 96 minutes and I think it's 10 minutes shorter when it just has one ending. Mm -hmm. So with just one ending, it doesn't even break an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. So but like I said, they still handle the slapstick well, but it has to become slapstick reliant when we get to that stuff. Yeah. And it's and it kind of and it wears out a little bit in a way that I don't think Knives Out ever does. Mm -hmm. So, do you have a uh, preference between the two? I think it just, just depends on your mood. If you <laughs> if you want a murder mystery, but you're feeling a comedy, Clue's perfect. If you want something that's a little more serious, Knives Out works. I mean, I think if I had to say which movie's better, it's probably Knives Out, but sometimes sometimes you don't necessarily need a good movie. You just want something that'll make you laugh, and Clue will definitely do that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I guess uh, that ends this. Yeah. So uh, I'm not entirely sure what our next one is. Um, but it's going to be something. And then we have a couple of uh, October themed ones we're going to do together as well. Um, one where we will be coming back to Tim Curry and may or may not have been referenced in this video at one point. <laughs> um, and then we're going to do a trilogy. It's probably going to be at the end of October. So, um, and if we do anything between those, uh, obviously you'll find out. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, um, do you have anything else to add? No. All right, then I guess uh, we're done here. Okay.